Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to everybody and thank you for joining us today for our first uh, hybrid event uh, coming back from COVID-19 uh, here at the Malaysia Global Business Forum. Uh, and today we've, uh, we've, we're looking at a very important topic, addressing weaponized information in the media. And, and we, we've got a very uh, distinct group of individuals uh, joining us as speakers. And of course, we've got our, our guest of honor. I'd like to welcome uh, Rear Admiral Dato Shamsuddin bin Haji Ludin. Thank you, sir, for, for joining us. Uh, who is the Director General of Defense, Cyber, and Electromagnetic Division for the Malaysian Armed Forces under the Ma Malaysian uh, Ministry of Defense, who's also the co-head of the Cyber Defense Security Conference and Exhibition uh, or, or Defense Services Asia, DSA, and, and more importantly, had recently won the uh, uh, Personality of the Year for Cybersecurity. Uh, thank you, Dato. Uh, for joining us. It's an, indeed an honor that you're here today. Uh, and and uh, of course, we've got a, a very distinct group of, of speakers, and, and I would dare say they're all VIPs. Uh, starting with Datuk Ahruddin Ahtan, or better known as Datuk Rocky, uh, who is, uh, uh, is the president of the National Press Club and, and a, a good friend of the Malaysia Global Business Forum as well. Mr. Anwar Yusuf, the head of the Department for Cybersecurity and International Engagement and Collaboration at Cybersecurity Malaysia. Thank you, uh, Anwar, for joining us, and I'm looking forward to your insights later. Dr. Kavita Muthi, uh, also a guest on our show last night, uh, and, and you know we're very excited to, to, to learn more about what you're, you're talking uh, about in terms of journalism and cyber safety as well. Uh, Mr. Ambita Shivasta. Thank you, sir, for, for joining us. Uh, you know, you, you come uh, with a huge resume of, uh, of success, uh, and, and we hope to dig into to, to some of your knowledge as well. Vix, uh, Vix of course, uh, you know, he's uh, famous himself, uh, you know, in, in social media and, and what he's been doing with, with cybersecurity and data resilience as well. Uh, and then uh, I, I, can't, uh, I can't go without mentioning Muru, uh, Muru is, is, is really a, a champion of someone who is, has really helped us put together this program. Uh, and I dare say without, without your support, so we wouldn't be able to get where we are today. And I, I'm very fortunate to have a good friend as well, Michael Warren. Uh, I, was, I wasn't sure if he was going to make it today, but he is here. Uh, and uh, he won't be speaking, but he's often uh, comments and, and gives us uh, insight and leadership uh, in this area. And this is, a, this is an important area, and, and I, I want to thank you all and for joining us. And of course, we've got members of the media here. And uh, for, for those people who are joining us online, uh, we, we thank you for, for joining online. Thank you for, for, for taking the time to be part of our program. Uh, so this is, in a sense, this is the way we will be doing it for the next uh, five to six months at the Malaysia Global Business Forum. Uh, small in-person uh, component to, uh, to the event, uh, large uh, international uh, audiences and local audiences uh, joining us online. Uh, so with that, I, I, I would like to thank you all for joining us. And, and I've, I prepared a little bit of information to, to frame the conversation. Uh, and, and kind of get to, to where we want to go uh, with today's topic. So I'll, I'll go to my slides uh, if we can. So what are we, what are we looking at? Uh, you know, and, and really when, what we're thinking about is what, what is the problem? Uh, and we've, we've kind of, we want to keep it simple uh, in, in a sense that uh, this is a highly complex technical area. Uh, but when we look at the problem, we, we look at gaps in, in, in cyber defense. We look at gaps also in goodwill. And why have I put goodwill there is because companies are often hit by a crisis. And when they're hit by a crisis, it may be the only thing that people know about them. So you have no, you've got no political capital or no goodwill capital. To, to get people to, to deal with your company. Uh, and that is something that is a, a, what we've seen happen to corporations time and time again. And, and what we're seeing is a lot of weaponized media attacks. And now it's hitting one key area. 
it, uh, sorry, we're not there yet. Um, but uh, what we're also seeing is criminal and competitive behavior. So criminal behavior is uh, people doing something, breaking the law, and going and, and creating this attack. The other is competitive behavior, which is your competitor, either direct or indirect competitor, is taking advantage of your problem and weaponizing it against you for market share. For, 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 for a business reality. And this is something that has come uh, time and time again. Uh, you know, how algorithms work, how, how social media uh, breeds of a crisis. Uh, also, corporations can benefit from someone else's crisis. And then, of course, it spills over into the media. And this, uh, you know, we'll, we, will, we will look at further and how it spills over into the media. Okay, next. So the impact is, is for me, is, is very simple. It's only three words, you know, uh, reputation, revenue, and share price. Uh, you, you know, and, and why I put share price there, you could put share price shareholder or, sh or, or stakeholder if you're talking about government agencies uh, as well here. But one of the things I like to look at and, uh, is public listed companies. Uh, not because they've got lots of money and not because they're, they're an excellent client, but more importantly, you can track a direct relationship with the crisis and the share price. And if you don't recover, it just continues to go down. Uh, and what happens is the reputation of the CEO is the first to go. Then the reputation of the, of the technical people who were supposed to fix that problem or have that problem solved is the next to go. Maybe in the media, it's just the CEO's reputation. But in the industry, if you're the guy who's, oh, you're, the, you're the, the head of IT or you're the CISO who was in charge of that disaster. So part of that problem is, is a reputational issue. And, and that is going to continue on. Uh, so let's go to the next one. Education, capacity building, and awareness. Uh, and, and this is really hard, hard work. You know, these are like bullet points. Uh, you know, you can say education, but I can tell you, you can spend days, months, weeks, years getting education right. Preparedness. Uh, I, is your organization, yes, you might be educated, you may be well-trained, you may have all the resources, but have you trained in being prepared for these attacks? The other problem that I see in preparedness is the, the interrelation between the different, the different divisions in an organization. You know, I, I always, for me, the analogy is there's, there's, a, there's an IT guy, you know, or a tech guy who, who understands all these uh, amazing uh, things. And then you've got your communications team, you know, flamboyant and, 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 and great communicators. Uh, communications team tech team, uh, crisis, nobody's had enough sleep, you know, and, and, and it's all a crazy reality, but you know, you, you, how do these two people communicate internally is for me the first problem. Because in, 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 in five minutes time, the media is, is, is calling you and they want to know what happened. And that's just in a good scenario, okay? So, this is what we want to talk about today. This is what we want the different speakers to talk about today. And, and uh, now, next slide, please. The threat matrix has changed. Now the question is, what are you going to do about it to survive? If you don't understand the threat matrix, if you're not dealing with the threat matrix, you are now going to become irrelevant, either through attack or just irrelevant because you're not able to handle the change in the economy. So that is what we're, that's what we're going to be discussing today. We want to get the different details from the different speakers, and then we'll have a, a panel discussion uh, later. So with that, I'll pass over the floor to Rosanna, who's moderating our session today. And again, thank you everyone who's joining us online. And thank you everyone who's here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Norden, and a good, a good morning to everyone here, as well as our viewers on live stream. Uh, well, I hope the presentation by Mr. Norden has helped to give us um, a glimpse of the anatomy of cyber attacks um, 
weaponized in the media. And obviously, to put this in context of our discussion today, well, the um, experts on our panel today will further elaborate on this subject um, in their five-minute presentations, which will be on alternate restrooms, just so we can keep um, SOP compliance and hygiene. Um, and uh, we, before we regroup on stage uh, for a panel discussion. Um, so now, without further ado, let us begin with our first speaker, Dato Ahiruddin Atan, President of the National Press Club, who is also, if um, we don't know it already, a Malaysian blogger and a long-time journalist and former editor, also known as Rocky Brew. Over to you, Dato. Thank you, Rosanna. <coughs> Nice poster, no? Anyway, um, Nodin, um, let me quickly uh, take this opportunity to thank Nodin for inviting me. Thank the Malaysian uh, Global Business Forum, <coughs> Ray Admiral, and my um, distinguished panelists. Thank you. It's, it's, it's an honor to be here. I am just going to take a shortcut here. You know, I'm going to... Uh, make it easy on myself and um, approach this topic from the point of view, the perspective of a media person, but a concerned media person, a journalist, and a very concerned journalist because uh, Norden said uh, uh, weaponized information is a threat to, is one of the huge threats to business in the digital economy. I see it also as a threat to the media itself, you know, because for some reasons, I'm, I'm glad I saw your uh, presentation. You said the impact uh, on reputation, revenue, and share price. You know? I've listed only two big impacts on the media, and that's credibility and integrity. And that's where I'm going to uh, approach this, uh, uh, this, this subject matter today from from my point of view as a journalist and, but before that let me uh, allow me to just uh, give my take on what i understand by weaponization it's quite scary when you get when i read the the invite from nodin weaponization of information i thought you were going to take me to a shooting range or <clears throat> a joint military exercise you know but then i mean i thought again you know the saying that about the saying that uh, the pen is mightier than the sword, that is violent. You know, there's an association uh, between a writing instrument and a weapon. You know? So it is basically not a new concept. Of course, there are many new elements, and the word the using weaponization brings it nearer to us because you know you think of weapons of mass destruction, chemical warfare, and things like that. So it's more violent and but it is it but it strikes closer to the truth as well you know because this this but the danger is real and like Nodin I think you hinted the game is spilling over to you know the weaponization of information is does not just happen between competitors and and um, political rivals and things like that but the media is also starting to see opportunities there and those opportunities are actually in the long term if we don't regulate or we don't control that it could be a threat to the media themselves so i i would uh, i i just uh, google the, the the definition of those keywords that we're going to handle i googled two days ago before the team lesner uh, affair came about uh, so Anything that anything that that I say is just coincidental. If it has to do with something that's yang apa yang hidup dan apa yang berskandal sekarang ya. Weaponization, weapon, um, weaponize, weaponization, weaponizing simply means adapting something for use as a weapon. The keyword is to gain powerful advantage yeah that's the keyword and the google give me this example she has been known to weaponize her femininity again no nothing to do with the lesner team lesner affair but there was the, the is she is 
what is the weapon what is weaponizing here the act of gaining that big advantage okay what is the weapon i don't know femininity i'm not sure but i google again so the word weapon is anything designed or used to inflict bodily harm or physical damage okay so it's not you know i don't think femininity can inflict physical harm or bodily damage you know maybe spiritual or, and other things but but as a weapon that's we there's a definition of weapon and then information is very simple information is facts about something or someone okay lesner is a tall guy you know it's that's about oh, that's my example not not from google but she is not that tall it's a fact Cik rosana is not that tall you know but she's pretty something like that it's a fact okay and then media okay this is the this is the big big word in our our weaponization and the media there are two elements in the media i'm going to uh, present one what is the media okay what is media is a basic definition of we all know what is media print media broadcasting advertising um tv tv3 and things like that and now we have the modern media the the, the new media Uh, you got news portals you got um, blogs face okay blogs are yesterday lah red emerald blogs dah tak apa dah tak hot lagi but we got tiktok we got uh, instagram and all sorts of those things you know and this these are the media that we are talking about hmm it is a new weapon but remember the media cannot weaponize themselves is the who in the media that we have the who in the media and who are the competitors who are the political rivalries these are the players that weaponize the media okay so the who in our context is very interesting because political parties government don't control the media they're not the sole um, controller owner of media of course we have all political parties with their political organs uh big media still under um, uh ruling party or the biggest opposition in this country but beyond that we have always had individuals the vincent tans the winot shakers the husamuddin uh, of sinars you know these are media owners you know like it or not you know they they employ journalists editors these are the generals and lieutenants and these are the people who if anything is to if anyone is to weaponize or to 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 use abuse content in the media these are the people you know and we also have players like the pr executives strategic comms you know um political analysts political activists people who use their positions their contacts their network to weaponize information in the media the difference between and this is where the challenge the threat uh, is in the past you have a problem with the media you know who they are you know the, you know you know who the news editors are you know who the journalists are you send you send a corporate com person a pr person to go and see them seek redress or get your get your uh, views across you can write letters to editors and so even though back then we still we had we had this but this you know media owners using using uh, uh, their media for their own advantage bn using the media to rule for 60 years and so on and so forth but you know who the people are they're not invisible they're not anonymous today the real challenge the threat is you have media owners all over in this room we have 30 people there are 30 media owners here you know how do you deal with people with influence of people who has who has uh, uh, their own access to platforms 700,000 new voters in johor you know that is 700,000 media owners facebook twitter 
blah, blah, blah. You know, every day you will find something. Of course, not all of them are going to be influential, but one or two, like that little Twitter thing that got our former AG um, jumping about, 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 about Vincent Tan's uh, son, you know, one small Twitter, one small account, weaponized. Remember, who fed the information to this Twitter? Somebody has to feed the information. Who we can only imagine, you know, uh, Tommy Thomas had a lot of enemies um, and who want, to, who want to do him in or who have information on him. So that information went out and overnight. The challenge is to, to uh, we, we are all stakeholders, investors. If you are an investor, you're a CEO of a company, you're a communications person, how do you deal with this new weapon in, in, in the media? You know? Like I said just now, even, even the media is jumping, jumping on the bandwagon. You know? I can't prove it, I don't want to prove it, but uh, media, media, media see it. Some media see it also as a revenue uh, stream, you know. When, when, uh, when uh, company A and company B, they, they, are, they are competitors, they want to kill each other, company A come to me and say that I've got information on, on uh, company B, I want to pit content, pit paid editorial to go out, you know. It used to be when editors and media owners said that, nope, we don't play that game. But now with advertising ringgit, everything's advertising dollar uh, diminishing and all that, sometimes you just have some, some media owners just say, okay, we'll do it. Everyone else is doing it, so why not? So that's, to me, that's a threat to uh, the media. Go back to the weaponized uh, information. What do we do about it? Like uh, corporate com people will have hell of a day to 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 find out to to find ways to reach out to the media owners to get redress for their for their um, clients. You know, political politicians will they they know how to deal with it. They just they just employ more cyber troopers to 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 beat the other cyber troopers. You know, but legitimate business. You know, how do you deal with it? The National Press Club has been has been a supporter of this um, proposed media council. Uh, sadly to say, this proposed media council has been forty years in the making. We have been we have been uh, 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 we have we have been advocating the media council because instead of regulation, we don't need any more laws and to regulate media. We we have, we we see an opportunity to self-regulate. You know, if we don't start here now, you know, you will see, you will see the media. You know, you don't, you don't put a framework. What is right? What is wrong? We don't. We're not saying that we know what is right, what is wrong. But as we go along, there are things that are not ethical. Clearly, not ethical. So we tick the box and say that nope, you can You know, you can use facts to. If if Lesnar is tall, you can't say he's short or he's. You know, you make references to, but to other references against him. So we tick the boxes and we get a National Media Council to um, uh, regulate, self-regulate the industry. I'm talking about just the media, not, not the politicians and all that. And, but immediately, immediately, for, for the bigger stakeholders here, the, 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 the communications people who have to deal with uh, this, um, this, uh, this weaponized information. What do they do? You know. So there's, there's, there's also a need there to try and make them understand that they need to respond to the, to the, to the half truths or to the lies out there. Sometimes when you, when you get, when you get information on Twitter, Facebook, or TikTok, you don't respond because you think that it's going to. There is always an opportunity to respond to that, uh, to to threats or to cyber attacks uh, or to weaponize um, uh, information on the media. You know, but we have to recognize first and foremost that the game has changed. We've got 
millions of media owners out there, and it's up to us, the, the stakeholders, to find a way together on how to deal with the threat. Thank you very much. You forgot to say something about your last slide. But this has been said before I was telling, somebody was telling me that, oh, uh, Red Mirror, you were telling me about the war, the war, the war is already being waged online, even though you know, the war has begun, even though they're just they're still talking about getting to war and all that, they've started it online. Thank you, Dato, for such an interesting speech and of course this intriguing thing uh, slide that will give us something to mull over. Um, next, I would like to call upon Mr. Anwar Yusof, the Head of Cybersecurity Industry Engagement and Collaboration De uh, Department at Cybersecurity Malaysia. Um, well, Mr. Anwar, of course, has more than 25 years of experience in the Malaysian ICT industry with skill sets in supply chain management, business process reengineering, and in the last 15 years in the area of information security. So, over to you, Mr. Anwar. Okay, uh, terima kasih. Assalamualaikum. Good morning. Mr. Nodin, terima kasih. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, Laksmana, nice to meet you here again, sir. And of course, uh, Lato, thank you for your... Uh, enlightening presentation from a press man yeah? and of course uh, my friends everybody uh, first of all minta maaf banyak-banyak sebab uh, my I need pemain gantian I'm a replacement player <laughs> Dato unfortunately had to uh, go back to call Kangsa the brother-in-law passed away and was just exchanging information with him about what's going on over there and over here so I think if you look at it um is this a source of problem or is this a solution? I, I don't know. I mean, to, to me, um, of course, I graduated with... Uh, can I have next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, I did engineering. I did aeronautical engineering in, in Florida. Uh, not full-time because my college was in Daytona Beach. So uh, most of the time we were on the beach. Part time, I went to school. Of course, I graduated with CGPA 2.4. <laughs> so um, uh, all these uh, interesting things that happened in Daytona Beach, lah, and Taya Cinta, lah, Bikers Week, and everything else. So when I came back in uh, 1988, was economic crisis, huge economic crisis. Uh, went to Malaysian Airlines in Subang Airport. They chased me out. They said, "Tada kerja sini, no get lost." And my first job was uh, as a salesman selling AutoCAD computers. And I remember the first deal I did was uh, I sold a Hewlett Packard 386 processor machine with 2 megabyte RAM and 100 megabyte hard disk. And it was 50,000 ringgit. Okay. So now this is about what? 8 gig RAM, 256 gig storage. The whole works what, what, 3,000, 4,000 ringgit? What is the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning? You look at your wife's face, uh, you open up this. Can, what is the last thing you do before you go to bed? Buka Quran, Bible, baca doa ke apa ke? Tak, you buka ni. Because you want to play, play Wordle. Anybody play Wordle here? Yeah, right kan? So you are waiting at 12 o'clock and see, you know, and among the family members, we have our competition. Who can get the fastest without going to, you know? So, uh, okay, my daughter and my son, they're good. Uh, so anyway, I think if we look at social media, weaponized information, I think the context here is, of course, in the media. But I will come from the cybersecurity uh, government perspective. And I think we understand that uh, sometimes it's the information that is going around. You know, I mean, you get on your WhatsApp message, and without thinking, you just forward it. Then you realize, alamak, benda ni betul ke tak? Right? So, without thinking, you just forward it. And, um, well, it depends. Sometimes we don't have the intention to cause harm. But we do not know what was the intention of the guy who wrote that. And, and I think we wonder whether these people, what are they doing, you know? I mean, how come you have so much of time to create, to craft all these messages? Some might be fake. Boleh minta next slide, please. 
Okay. So, okay, of course, what they are trying to do is, this is cognitive, okay? They want to get into your brain. They're playing with it. But uh, can I have the next slide? Because I'm sorry, uh, I mean, I'm stealing your thunder here. <laughs> okay. So, um, we, we are still going through pandemic now. Okay. I mean, it's not over yet with Omicron, so on and so forth. Remember when, when it first started, all this news that was coming out and, and you know, even Donald Trump himself was saying, uh, all you need to do is uh, gargle with uh, Clorox, wash yourself and all that nonsense. So, this, these are the problems, okay? What is misinformation, okay? Misinformation is probably innocent, lah, you know, saying that, well, um, ball short guys catch COVID-19 faster than tall guys because you are nearer to the earth, I don't know. Or maybe tall guys get it faster because you are higher up there. I don't know. So this this is innocent lah, misinformation kan. And then you have disinformation purposely being done. Uh, those guys that go for vaccination, you're gonna have health problems. Uh, because of what? Because you look at what happened to Sir Bergasing after the booster jab, he went exercising and he died. Okay, that is. To some extent, disinformation. Then, of course, male information. Okay, so people like uh, Novak Djokovic don't need to do vaccine. So we have to understand the distinction. What is misinformation? Just for innocent, playful purposes, saja ka? Disinformation and uh, male information. I guess that's what we are going to be doing here, lah. We have our conversation later. And um, allow me just to, I, I. I read some research lah last night, kono kono kan, engineer, government worker kan, and I think I would like to read here um, scandals like Cambridge Analytica expose the discovery of the Russian troll farm. Remember how Donald Trump became the president because of all the Facebook articles, the fake news, and all that stuff. So uh, this highlights uh, that adversary governments can weaponize information in pursuit of financial or political objectives. Okay, So, um, right now, uh, Dato, you showed us Putin. And uh, yes, you know, World War Three is probably going to be online. Then, um, I think we need to look at, uh, over here, lah, definition. Okay, There are four general kinds of uh, weaponized information. The first one are exposed truth that are damaging okay and then of course a second would be amplification of half truth and misinformation the third one complete falsehoods and disinformation and finally the technical information okay so uh, okay i think we are clear the first one harmful truth we have to detect we must identify them we must expose them and make sure this is handled properly okay Second, half-truth or misinformation. This is very dangerous, okay? I don't know who is propagating this. Could be boss who, could be, you know, boss me or boss who. Depends, okay? Some people are just good with social media. And you have to give credit to him, okay? How he turned around, how he, you know, his image using Facebook, using social media. Credit goes to him, okay? Uh, unfortunately, our senior, senior minister, Mahade. He is more academic. Uh, his blogs are so long. I think because of social media, our attention span is very short. Okay, siapa lah nak baca semua ni? Okay, orang tua ni dah nyanyok dah. Sinai, give it away. Okay, so these these are the things that we are going through. And of course, the third one of this outright falsehoods, deception. Okay, this is memang nak menipu orang lah. Just want to cheat people. And and I think for me personally. The last part is on the technical side. And this is where we look into cybersecurity, uh, all this ransomware, malware. And uh, I mean, this, these are the technical aspect of it. Okay, so um, that brings me to next slide, please. What's going to happen? Okay, is it Facebook or is it a fake book? This unfortunately is going to be worse. Okay. Tak tahulah, I think in Islam we say this akhir zaman fitnah akan berleluasa, you know, towards the end of age. Everybody is a creator of news. Everybody can write some stories, you know. So we are all reporters, macam Datuk cakap tadi lah kan. 
So um, this is not going to be easy. How are we going to handle this? Next slide, please. All right. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Is, is Putin serious? Is he bluffing? Is this just to increase the petrol price so they get more money? Look, I think only about a year or two ago, per barrel was about $30, $40, $50, and now it's $100. So imagine, you know, I mean, if you're doing in business, you're same output, but you are getting double that money. So I don't know. I mean, he might be serious. Uh, there might be a lot for him to gain by taking over Ukraine. Um, after all, Donald Trump married to a Ukrainian woman. Uh, okay, that's beside the point. All right. Lagi satu. Nak habis dah ni. Okay, sabar, sabar. And I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think Putin is bluffing. Okay? I think he's bluffing. I, I don't think he's going to attack. There is a lot at stake here. Okay? Uh, his economy, and, and I don't think he wants to go down as, uh, you know, uh, man, 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 man. I, I don't know. I might be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. Okay? Because the best way to subdue your enemy is without fighting, and it's all by bluffing. And I guess that's what uh, this weaponized information is all about. It could be advertising if you're trying to sell something, you know? Like, uh, bald guys are sexy. Yeah, man. That's, I don't know. Uh, it's, 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 I mean, this, this is what we are referring to now, okay? Uh, is it propaganda when the government tells you that we are better off today than yesterday? Or is it just uh, cheating, bluffing? All right. Uh, I think we are good in creating buzzwords. Sorry, Nodin, with all due respect, weaponized uh, information. But I think if we go back to just the normal words, lah, fitna, lying, bluffing, hey, you tipu, you bluff, you know, you pegang bola, that kind of stuff during school days. So sometimes it's easier to handle the problem if you just go back to the roots, under, understand the problem, uh, what needs to be done, because there will always be liars among us. And they grow up to become dot 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 dot. <laughs> okay, um, they are always guys that are trying to be honest. Uh, Inshallah, we have to fight this. We have to be critical. We need to have critical reasoning. We must understand the source of all this. Where is it coming from? Where all these lies are coming from? Is it from Romania? Is it from somewhere in uh, Pahang? Ke, apa ke? And, and we have to call them out. That is our responsibility. Because when we allow these liars, these cheats, we have a problem with the country. We have a problem with our integrity. We're going to lose. Okay? We cannot allow them to cheat us. We cannot allow them to bluff us. Call out their lies. Tell them, you know, the WhatsApp messages they are sending is wrong. And don't do that. All right? So uh, I think I'd like to end with that. Thank you very much. Let's have a good discussion. Thank you, Mr. Anwar. This is uh, very insightful and it's um, adding you know, to the gravity of the topic, really. Um, now, up next is our third panelist for the day, Dr. Kavita Muthi, the rose amongst the thorns, amongst the speakers today. Um, she's a Chief Strategy Officer at Intelize Tech Services and is an experienced security consultant with a demonstrated history of working in the information technology and services industry. Skilled in crisis management, requirements analysis, crisis communications, business continuity planning, and project management. Let's hear what Dr. Kavita has to say today. Thank you very much, Rosanna. Selamat sejahtera and hi. Very good morning. Namaskar. Manakam. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very nervous actually, especially after Dato spoke and we've got Laksamana here and we've got people like Nordin and Che Anwa just rolled the floor just now, oh my god. I just told my colleague, I don't know what am I going to talk, you know, with the whole topic, especially when I come to the room this morning. Though I had an initial discussion with Rosanna, I was checking with Che Anwa this morning, what are we supposed to talk about today? So that means we need something sensational, isn't it? That's why we are here to talk about all the information. I'm going to start with the story. 
Uh, there was once upon a time, or twice upon a time, uh, there's a beggar who was actually sitting and always waiting for food to be served. And there's another beggar who came to this beggar A and said, what are you waiting for? Oh, I'm waiting for food. You don't wait for food here. Now, I tell you where to get your food. At 8 morning, you go to Temple A, and this is the menu. At 11 morning, you go to Temple B, and this is the menu. At 1 p.m., you go to Temple C, and this is the menu. And 4 p.m., 6 p.m., 7 p.m., 8 p.m. So he has actually given all the time with all the menus that being served at all the temples. So this beggar A asked me, how did you know that? Isn't that what you call information? Right? So that information is very important. And imagine, even a beggar needs those informations to live his life. Now, 56% of people today, always on internet, and then the, third, the balance of the percentage of the people, this is reported by Forbes, saying that, I think I have caught, yeah, the 34% of consumers are using the internet as an extension of their life. That's what Anwar spoke about. That's what Mr. Rocky Nato spoke about this morning, saying that oh, in social media. I like this part when Dato mentioned about TikTok. Now, TikTok is actually a new weapon that used by many people to expose unfortunately, their weakness more than their strength. So that's what we have realized. And we also moving towards cyber war, which, uh, Laksamana, we have actually spoken about cyber warfare in your department 10 years ago, right? So today we are here witnessing what is really happening. That's the reality that we have. And I, 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 I've caught this interesting part, which I talked to uh, Rosanna about weaponized information. Now, Datu has actually given a very good example um, about weapon. Now, I go for martial art as well, which is called Silambam in Tamil. So it's a very famous martial, martial art that it's, you are given a stick that you need to defend yourself. If you don't use the stick properly to defend yourself, also to attack people, but it can also harm you. So that is what the real meaning of weapon. Now, this is the problem that today I must tell that journalists are facing as well. I also must admit that I work with many medias. Journalists are my good friends. Uh, I cannot say they are my enemy, though some of them tried. Right exactly on the day that uh, uh, Laksamana was there, Che Anua was awarding our company of receiving the best um, innovation company of the year. Right on the day of the award that I've got a threatened message from a media saying that, look, I have this information about the project and the company that you're working with. If you don't count a statement today before this time, I will release this news tomorrow. And all the information that he have written in that context, the statement that he have prepared, was completely manipulated information that was leaked by the company itself. I think I spoke to Nordin about insiders' attack yesterday. 80% of the attacks comes from the inside, right? So these are the threats that we are living with today. Nobody knows that the information was leaked by an insider. Now, that's... That's the fact of this. some of the journalists, of course, being my friend, I've communicated with them in all the time, been communicating with them in all time. Yesterday, one of the anchor of the program who called me at 11 a.m. in the morning, I said, Doc, this is what had happened to me, and am I in the right track? Am I safe? The thing was, he was scammed and almost lose money of 100 over 1,000 he's saving. So imagine... What is journalists are going through, the media personnel is going through. Thanks to Nche Anwar who spoke about cyber security. I'm going to talk about cyber safety for journalists. If you don't use the information that you have in your hand appropriately, right? It's a weaponized information. Now, this information can also harm themselves. So when we talk about harm, there were two challenges that our friends, journalists, or the media personnel are going through. Number one, they are also threatened you know, physically. It is also a life-threatening for them. And there are also threatening of their identity. And uh, good that Nordin spoke about reputation, their image. Now we are talking about 
safeguarding this information in an organization, what the CEO have to worry about is the same information that the media is planning to release. But if they don't do appropriately or using it against that company and the same people, are, you know, the company themselves, the owner of the business, whoever, the big boss inside, are very upset with this media journalist, with this journalist and can attack this person. That had happened. We have seen that journalists have gone missing, was murdered, right? So this is a life threatening. And why is that happening? Because of the information that they use as a weapon today is harming them. So they got to be careful when handling those information. Now, talking about information, typically those days, they were taking information from many other aspects. But today, we are living in a digital information era. And informations are very easy to be obtained. I don't have to worry, but just click away. I can get all information that I needed. And these are the information that when they take true online, they got to be very, very careful because the online data are not verified and validated. If they use or misuse the data, again, it's going to harm them, right? And then on the online identity, today I can, I, there is actual Kavita, say if I'm a journalist and I have my blog or I'm doing my writing and I've got my papers released and all that. What if another person who is also trying to fake my identity and open up a social media and start writing something against what I've written positively? So online identity breaches is also happening. Data and uh, information leakages is happening. And also those people that who is using mobile like in Chanwa is actually showed us an example. We are living with the devices always moving with our devices, always connected over the internet. And we think that the internet and wherever we move around, we are safe. How do we know that we are actually safe? So these are the threats that actually our journalists are facing. Uh, in fact, those journalists who comes to me or some of my media friends who comes to me, hey, no, um, I'm trying to get this information. I, I also browse, isn't it? But how do I ensure that I'm not traced by the ex-parties, right? So we give them education. How do you do safe browsing? I've given some example yesterday. And how do they keep their information secured? Because when they do anonymous browsing, right, it's a bit difficult for them to be traced. And at the same time, the information is kept discreetly among themselves and the sources that they are sharing with the people that they're supposed to share with are also kept safe. So we are talking about safety. We are talking about weaponized information. Then I must make sure that I keep this information safe and I also need to make sure that I am safe when I am dealing with information digitally, right? So how do we do that? That's the biggest question now. I did share to Nordin yesterday that in other countries, like well-developing countries and all that, all those journalists or who those want to become someone in the media industry, they are going through cyber safety first before they even go online to publish anything. How do they do safe browsing? How do they do safe secure writing? How do they careful with the sources that they have? How do they know that the people that they're asking questions are the ones that trusted? Note in our crisis management practice, we, so we, we tell our CEOs, hey, look, you know, you got to treat this media person as your friend. And we've got some um, seal suites that behave like an ostrich. Me? Media? Why? I'm not in crisis, remember? So at that point of a time where media also actually fake their identity, enter into that company, try to buy in some information from the employees. So when that company people got to know that this gentleman have done it, they have physically attacked him. So you need to deal with information securely and safely, ensuring that your physical safety is there and ensuring the data that you're using is not misused, right? So... Um, and my point, so I would like to end this uh, by saying that um, cyber safety training is very important for journalists. And if you think that you want to sustain in the digital um, era, becoming a journalist, and you have to ensure that the online safety and how do you secure your information, your physical uh, security is also important. So if the weapon is not used carefully, it will definitely harm you. 
and it will we are not far from cyber war as well so let's all together prepare ourselves especially the journalists you need to learn how to educate yourself how to be cyber safe so that's important with that i'm open for more discussion later and i would like to give my time over for other speakers to also share their thoughts thank you very much catch up with you all later thank you dr kavita and the plot thickens for all of us um, i think um, but yeah okay Be <laughs> Before um, anything else, let's um, welcome Mr. Amitav Srivastava, Practice Director of Cyber Security and Chief Information Security Officer at Abires Holdings, Niram Berhad. A seasoned management professional, leader and strategist with over 20 years of experience in sales, marketing and operations. Over thank to you, you, Mr. Amit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosa. You know, after so many good speakers, it's very difficult to find a new point to talk about. And almost all the point, my points Anwar took. Uh, so it's very, very difficult for me to do anything. But what I will do is actually do a small summarization and take you through some new areas. What I wanted to do was to give you some numbers. Okay, So let's start with some very interesting numbers. 7.9 billion. You know what this number is? This is world's population. Okay. 2.9 billion. You know what this number is? This is the total number of Facebook subscribers. 290.5 million. You know what this number is? This is total number of active Twitter user, users on average. Okay? This is the universe that you're talking about. So I will spend a little time on trying to tell you about the word weaponization. Though Anwar talked about misinformation, disinformation, let me take you a st uh, step further. There is a gentleman called as Robert Caldini. And he wrote something very, very interesting, which is used by us today uh, in social engineering. And Kavita and a lot of us will agree that we, we talk a lot about uh, these cognitive biases, which help us become very good at social engineering. And it's a vector we use very effectively uh, as um, to counter hackers, and count hackers use it very effectively to actually compromise you. So Mr. Cardini said that uh, if you look at the world uh, and individuals uh, you know, in different stratification of this world, they will behave in the same way no matter which economic status they come from. So if I say, Nudin, you're doing a great job, yeah, how does it make you feel? Makes you feel good. And you are forced to react. Oh, you're like, you know, when you go to a wedding, somebody tells you you're doing, you're looking so nice. Oh, you will also, uh, you know, uh, reciprocate and say, oh, yes, you are also looking very, very good. It's human nature to react like this. And these six principles of cognitive bias actually drives what what, and how we actually weaponize content. So uh, yesterday I was telling uh, Rosanna a very interesting fact is uh, if I send you a very emotionally charged video, floods in Malaysia, this kid crying on the roadside, and this video hits you and comes to you, what is the first impression that you get? Things are not all right. Okay, and then you need the second part. Whom should I blame? And this is very interesting because the word here, which is the key word that we are talking about is media. I am of, uh, of the opinion, and, and Dr. Rocky, I do apologize, that I don't think we should blame media. Because media is also us. It's a representation of what we actually project out. So we shoot that video, put it on one of the sites like Facebook or Twitter, and then 20 of us follow it and distribute it forward. Okay, I'm not even going towards cybersecurity right now. So what effectively we have done is, if it was hashtag floods in Malaysia, we are now populating that hashtag more and more. Suddenly it will become a very popular stream. And this young general, journalist sitting in one of these news portals says, ah, this is the trend right now. This is an important and critical information to report. What will he do? He will bring it to the 
news portal that he is handling and suddenly you have a larger reach this is the mechanism by which it actually grows so as i said i will spend time on how weaponization happens so let me take you to the second example and uh, rear admiral is here i have dealt with military cyber defense and intelligence agencies almost for what 20, close to 20 years we don't find wars on twitter twitter is not the place to find uh, wars facebook is not the place to have an opinion you will say why am i saying that facebook is a place to have an opinion no facebook is a place to initiate an opinion you start a conversation because an opinion needs to permeate it needs to distribute before it actually has any impact now let me tell you where the cyber warfare and the media will play very critical and i am thankful for uh, uh, putin's image uh, dato in the end and as uh, chianwar rightly mentioned i don't know if he is bluffing or not bluffing no, he's not. He uh, he so uh, he, so i was just about to say that uh, what is the point of bluffing when you know you can uh, kill it with a single shot and uh, you need to understand there are a few countries around the world their capability is beyond measurement when it comes to cyber security and russia is one of them i am not trying to praise them but they have enormous capability and the way they use media is slightly different and i will take you to some keywords and you tell me what comes to your mind okay rick gates has anybody heard about him donald trump has anybody heard about him okay the russian hack cambridge analytica facebook twitter what does it all if i say all these words together what comes to your mind us general election which elected president donald trump to power rick gates was an individual who actually effectively went using a tool uh, to talk to every social media company and say we need to influence the decision making process in us republican nominations first and later on to the general election to elect a president this is reported this has been captured again and again now he obviously uh, in, uh, collected all this information and must have done something which we do not know it's under investigation and the reports are still not out till the at least i have not read it but the fact is if you look at it very carefully what are you effectively looking at a third party who is not related to media actually starts to influence how the reporting will be and this is a this is the reason i am not trying to defend media or i'm standing against the broad popular opinion media is often driven by what the actual cause and effect is on the ground so if the flood videos are very aggravating you have to report it it's not looking all right out there and the decision making process is compromised the blame factor let me go a step further there is a gentleman another gentleman who wrote a very beautiful book and i will encourage a lot of people in this room to read it it's called as laws of human nature it's written by a gentleman and i think uh, shamshuddin has read it by robert green uh, this is in fact if you read this book this topic will become very interesting to you because this book is it has nothing to do with what you type on that uh, you know word limited twitter or what you blog in that uh, beautiful site called as facebook or fake book as chianbar put it it's about how you will react as a human being when you are put under a condition of different diverse information points and these biases are inbuilt in you as a human so one of the biases let me just take it it's called as the bias of blame yeah and this is very interesting why because if there is something which you are confronted with your first natural reaction is whom should i actually put the blame on and it comes from a very natural human behavior which is basically i need to pass it on 
and this is captured in the book the second one is uh confirmation whatever i do it's a called as the confirmation bias whatever i do i need validation and confirmation from people if you know uh, confirmation comes in i feel good about it and these are tricks and techniques which are used by the words uh, word like fake news the earlier 1940s word same word different uh, definition uh, propaganda and there's a gentleman uh, well not a gentleman but somebody called as joseph goblin and you need to talk a goblin is named gobels um, and you need to look into what he actually propagated what propaganda was in for, uh, 40s is what fake news is today and this reality it actually is captured very beautifully in this book and today uh, as a part of this panel discussion i will spend a lot of time uh, with the team trying to discuss the word weaponization I'm not trying to defend media but i want to give it the most logical face they are at times our representation to the general public uh, all of us actually form a part of media and uh, it's very wrong to say how media is getting weaponized but i think they are part of the weaponization cycle we are all in some way co actually contributing towards the weaponization so thank you very much i will see you in the panel discussion thank you ritam thank you mr amit very insightful and we will look forward to that panel discussion on the media and the role in weaponizing information now Finally, allow me to call upon Mr. Vix Kanagasingam, Chief Executive Officer of Sense of Digital Sundaram Berhad, who has over 28 years of experience in leadership roles in sales, marketing and operations primarily in the telecommunications and IT industry. His aims to bridge the digital divide by accelerating digital adoption across communities, enterprises and governments has placed him among his peers as the Robin Hood of tech. So give it away to Robin, the Robin Hood of tech. Thank Thanks, uh, Rosanna. And good morning, everyone. Uh, firstly, let me take the blame for producing the mobile phone. I, I'll tell you a bit about myself. So I started my career with Motorola, and then I joined this company called Benaria. Before even it was called Maxis. So Maxis, when we first uh, started the network, we launched the mobile phone. People were just sending SMS and making voice calls, and we were producing we were producing data like five to ten. They call it CDRs and EDRs, call detail record or event detail record. For young guys, you won't understand what I'm talking about. Uh, so those were called. So that's how we actually uh, spec the hardware, the servers. What Ame was talking about, and uh, we will spec it for maximum ten events per day, per person. All right, you'll, you'll get five or six calls. You send two, three SMS, and you receive a voice uh, notification for your SMS, your voice call. And then we build it, we build a spec. And then later in 2008, the smartphone started coming out, and it boomed. And when I say boom, the data was incredible. Uh, the amount of data that was produced is is mass. Uh, today, uh, they say that we look at our phones maximum on average. Three times a day, we spend about five to ten. Even I'm sitting down there at the back, I observe. Everyone's looking at the phone at least five every five minutes. All right, it's like a natural phenomena. So, I'm I, I'm actually brought here today by Nordin and Muru is to talk about artificial intelligence with regard to cyber security. Actually, we are all cyborgs. We already have artificial intelligence. If I take your phones away, you cannot survive. All right, uh, I sit in the car. The first thing some my friends would do ways. It's like, bro, you know how to get to A to B? No, I just want to find a shortcut. All right, they want to feel secure. All right, they want to uh, whatever they need to do when they leave the home, they need the phone. All right. Uh, so at the end of my five minutes, I'll give you some wisdom. I'll follow through from. I mean, it was a very good philosophy on you know how to react uh, to data. So to me. Data is actually the you know you say a pen is mightier than a sword. Actually, the data is mightier than the pen and the sword because the amount of data we have is incredible, and the human race cannot manage it themselves. You as an individual cannot manage the data by yourself. So that's where artificial intelligence comes into play. 
right? How you manage the data, especially for companies, enterprises, and stuff. And I think in the future, there'll be uh, artificial intelligence available for individuals on their app to tell you what time to wake up, what to eat, where to go. They know you. It's already happening today. When we had the chat, Nordin, in our working lunch session, we talked about how the uh, social media has been used by retail services to know when you log in, what's happening. They will start selling you stuff on the site. And you'll be surprised. You look at something at Lazada, next thing you know, your phone is giving you advertisement on other stuff that's similar to that same product. Do you know, this is for your information, your phone is constantly talking to the network even while you're not using your phone. All right? Your GPS location, your information, what you browse, it's sent to the network. So the amount of data is produced is incredible. So when, when you talk about cybersecurity, it's a big challenge, all right? We talk to companies, enterprise, they, they say, listen, uh, I don't need cybersecurity. I just starting Amit early in the morning. Cybersecurity is like selling insurance, guys. I don't need insurance, all right? Un until, unless you get hurt. And this is a challenge exercise. When we talk about cybersecurity with AI, they said, what's the ROI? What's the business case? I said, mate, the ROI in business case is reputation and, you know, and the value in case it hits you. Right? We need to go down. So I, I actually go to leaders to wake up and say, you need to know what's going on out there. You need to understand that the amount of data that's coming in into your organization and going out is massive. You can put as many firewalls you want. It's not going to help. And today, in today's environment, you need to collaborate. You need to co-create internally and externally. We are no, no one's an island. All right? So when, when we talk about how you manage this collaboration and managing, you need artificial intelligence to help manage the mass amount of data because it's volume and you need to react very quickly. That's why AI is actually used to react very quickly, understand what's going on. So we cannot run away from AI. Uh, I wrote, that's why was it Nordin said, I read a lot of stuff on, on LinkedIn. Uh, I just said, uh, AI is actually, uh, if you don't re-engineer yourself as an individual, AI is going to replace you. All right. Uh, so I'm just going to end this with a couple of things. Uh, when you talk about how you react to media information with cybersecurity, I, I just want to say there's two things, two words, why we get into trouble, why we get into scam, why companies get into scam. Two words is between greed and gratitude. Why you get into scam because of greed. I want to do better. I want to have more. All right? And that's why you get scammed. When you really understand the root cause of why you were scammed, 100,000 ringgit, you know, because you wanted more. All right? That's the easy way out. All right? I want to have more money. I want to have more information. It's greed. If you put gratitude in front of greed, you say, listen, I'm grateful what I have. I can do more, help and make the world a better place, share my information, to push through gratitude, I can conquer the hackers. Companies who actually struggle with cybersecurity is greed. Why? They don't want to spend money to create the infrastructure. They don't want to spend money to develop the resources. Cybersecurity is not technology. Technology is the tip of the iceberg. It is a people, process, and technology. You need to start with the people. All right? I was just giving an example to Nordin the other day. Imagine the receptionist. She comes to the, at the reception of the big complex. Let's say this is Petronas. Huh? Petronas might get me in trouble. but And then she finds a thumb drive on the, on the reception. What does she do? She plugs into the laptop. And that's it. You know why? Because of greed, you didn't want to spend money to educate your people and explain to them the importance of cybersecurity. This is what happens. So I like to end for to all of you all. It's actually the problem starts with us, not social media, not data, not pen, not sword. It's us. Change starts with us. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Vegs. That's a very interesting wrap to almost the um, beginning of the panel discussion, actually. Um, please give us a few minutes so that... Um, the lovely team at Hilton can help turn, turn around the panel discussion set up.
Okay, so uh, Putin was not bluffing. He has already yeah, started the military operation on Ukraine. He has attacked uh, Donbass. Tough guys. So uh, it's not online. Let's talk. It's not online anymore. Now it's physical, it's kinetic. Yeah. They have started uh, bombing mm. Donbass. Oh. oh boy. Okay, let's start. Uh, well, okay. So um, that was really insightful. Every um, to you know all this the, the presentations, and I think it's a lot to um, to swallow <laughs> to be honest. Um, but yeah, I I think what I what I noticed at least is that you know with the theme weaponized information, a lot of it weapons in itself. You know, a lot of it has to do with the humans behind it, like Dato Raki pointed out. You know, it's also who you know, uses this information and w based on which platforms. Um, but really, what I think um, we would like to kind of get into is, you know, what does this mean to, uh, you know, the CEOs, to the organizations, even to the people out there? What does this mean, this threat of, you know, um, weaponized information? Maybe uh, if, you know, um, everyone can give a little, yeah. Yeah, the tough one we give to you, lah. Huh? They must change yeah. the tradition. Yeah, yeah. yeah gentlemen. No more the one in the long same. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Rosanna, thank you very much for that question. I think it's one of the um, the best best question. Also, I must say to begin with, because the CEO really have to worry about the information that has been floating in an organization. So I'm going to talk about um, this particular matter from uh, my experience and my perspective being a business continuity practitioner. And uh, one of the most important activity that we does um, uh, while implementing BCP in an organization is to perform the business impact analysis. So when we do the business impact analysis, we actually narrow down certain aspect of risk assessment as well. And then uh, what are those risks actually, what kind of impact it has to the organizations? And uh, going back to the three elements, which is people, process, and technology, always, always technology is something that we take the first point, and then we start looking at the IT guys. Hey, it's your responsibility, you know? Anything goes wrong, it's you. I'll terminate you. CTO, be prepared with your resignation when there's a hacking incident happening in an organization. So very... Um, I must say that some of the, the, the C-suites are always sitting back and thinking this is the CTO's problem, IT manager's problem. But technology problem, put that aside, what leads to that technology problem is the people. It's a process that which is not governed, which is not enforced. Yes, you have information security policy in an organization, but who is actually enforcing it? I spoke about cyber security or cyber safety in the heart of human resource. So it takes a lot for the HR people to really understand what are you talking about? What, what kind of, what do you mean by in the heart of human resource? Actually, HR, they've got more bigger tasks to uh, implement, to take responsibilities, to ensure that the people actually follows the process, whichever the governance has been set, the compliance of handling information in their company. Now, if the CEO thinks, hey, information, I've already have all my infra set up, application, multiple layer of security being implemented, and why do I have to worry about information leakages? Yeah, you don't know who is actually watching your information inside. I did mention this yesterday about um, people who is spying the corporate espionage. Right. So if this thing is happening, what are the impacts that we are talking about? We are talking about the financial impact. If they are Berhad company, public listed company, even more worse, they have to think about the share market, about their own reputation. To a certain extent, the C-level are the one, the C-suite, the CEO are the one that need to be prepared with their resignation letter. Can I come back? Of course, I mean, I'm thinking each of you know, I, I, I have, Go for it. I'm, I'm dying <laughs> to say <laughs> this. I'm, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, Kavita. I, uh, there are two things I want to share. The first one is um, we have just completed a pilot project in Mampu on data leakage. And uh, we have hard facts, statistics, numbers of kebocoran maklumat, data leakage, within the 200 pilot users. All. But the sad fact is, you know, when this was brought up, eh, tapi saya tahu dia ni 
uh, ni bukan sengaja ni, ni tak sengaja ni, ni dia nak buat kerja kat rumah, so on and so forth. So, unfortunately, you know, when management themselves don't take this seriously, okay, then there is a serious problem itself. You know, it's like, oh, tak apalah yang ini, uh, dia, dia, you know, uh, ini kawan saya, saya kenal dia, dia memang bukan nak buat ni. I mean, this is, you know, I know this guy, he's not going to be doing all these things. But the sad thing is, these are the people part and the policies that was not being followed. Uh, that is one issue, you know, when management is not aware, management does not take this seriously. And another story that I want to share is again, this one I don't want to say what or which government agency. I, I've shared this story many times. Again, we were presenting to the management on data leakage. And this is our local development. We partnered with a local company to do this uh, solution. And we were presenting to the CEO on data leakage, kebocoran maklumat and all that thing. So he asked this question, you know, that um, uh, kalau dia curi data ni semua, kalau benda ni dia curi, uh, original tu kat mana? So we explained to him, uh, dia copy data tu. Tapi original ada lagi lah. Yes, original ada lagi. Oh, kalau macam tu tak apalah. I tak hilang lah. Original, original ada lagi. So, when when you have this kind of CEO who don't understand that the data has been leaked out and he thinks that data stolen is like money stolen. I have 10 ringgit, you steal 10 ringgit. Ah, I have no money. That, I think, is what needs to be done the sea level themselves have got to be aware. Look, this is serious. I need to know what to do. Okay. Uh, I think you guys have something to add on to that. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add a few things. You need to actually define this question slightly uh, indifferently. I'll, I'll just explain why. There are a lot of legacy organizations which have legacy CEOs. Their understanding of technology and especially cybersecurity is possibly as per the briefings given to them. So let me start from that perspective. So when they look at this problem, they look at it as a technical problem, The what Kavita was mentioning. And there is another business reality that you need to understand. 80 to 90% of attacks which happen worldwide are because of internal threats. Yeah. Externally, if you want to evaluate, it's roughly around, again, talking to which report, you know, looking at which report, 10 to 20%. And if you look at all the cybersecurity concepts, defense in depth, we will have multiple layered security, intrusion detection system, intrusion protection system, is to do what? <coughs> have external <coughs> attack surfaces being verified, attacking your external attack surfaces. The only internal technology that we are talking about is actually people education. I think there was a very nice slide and I was so happy Nurdin did not use the word training in it because I have a severe objection to word <coughs> training because you can train dogs to jump from here and roll and all that. You can't do that to human beings. You have to educate them. So one of the critical factors of all this equation for the sea level is to have an educated cyber security setup. And my brother uh, uh, Chianwar puts it very beautifully in some of his sessions. He called it build. He calls it building cyber hygiene in an organization. Now let me define it slightly more better. Now let's go to the second round, which is CEOs which are younger, who are taken over. They have come over a generation which is more technically savvy. Okay. Do they look at security the same way as the legacy CEOs? Maybe not. Because they are both basically younger, they are in startups, their prioritization is to set up the businesses. So their treatment of security is very different. But to, if you look at both these worlds, the middle part is the process. And let me tell you the 80 to 90 percent internal policy failure leading up to an internal attack is people and then process. And what is a simple process that, for example, disable all the USB drives when you issue a laptop to an employee? OK, doesn't happen. Uh, do not ensure that no USB external USB is inserted. I think somebody gave a very good example USB insertion. 
yeah is inserted in fact one of the biggest attacks in the world which is an apt now uh, on a nuclear power plant happened because somebody inserted a usb this was the iranian uh, stuxnet attack so over to you <laughs> sorry for the long thank you uh, rozana <clears throat> i think uh, uh, i was listening to my panel my my fellow panelists i think we have found some common ground here immediately okay maybe maybe if i were to just a do a little quick analysis on what we said today um uh my friend you 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 put you drew down the four um for manipulation of you know, mal the manipulation of um weaponization of information that is useful with now we know the four types of uh, put right down to technical Correct. details you know very useful very educational and um 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 the, the dear lady dr kavita said they need to train journalists you know that i i was attracted to that because journalists are the front and we are the reporters you know if you are not trained in cyber security not trained on never you do not know uh, how secure you are then you wouldn't be able to carry out the job uh, to the best of your ability you know again vix are uh, you to talk about uh, grit and um, gratitude you know again you said a change must start with us okay we got all the high tech data or not but change starts with us and brother you said you not but you actually agreed with me you said yeah but you're not we are not to blame the media like i said media is media can manipulate uh, people behind the media so we are actually agreed on the fact that manipulation weaponization uh, it boils down to certain people some people i i i not i uh, identified the owners media owners media owners not just the politicians or the government or corporations Who, who own media, but to every one of us who has our Facebook, our our Instagram account, and like you said, it has to start with us, you know. But the most important thing to me is the education. Like you said, we need to educate, educate ourselves, not just the CEOs, but the journalists, the every stakeholder. Uh, that I think we have actually come to that uh, agreement in some sort. What we need now is for Chief Rosana to just bring together. everything and see what's the next step what do we do next <laughs> that is actually my next because uh, so but, but i let you uh, i will i will segue to the next step so i think uh, when you talk about leadership when you talk about cyber security we go to organization uh, you must remember as a ceo i'm still running a company okay business as usual suddenly you come and say i need to do this transformation i need like what do i do to stop running the business and then do the transformation so one of the rule of thumb from my experience is we always tell clients through the whole digital transformation in cyber security listen you run your business but it's 80 20 rule it means 80% of your time your team is focused on business as usual 20% is on improvement innovation and transformation so therefore it becomes a culture that means continuous transformation is a it's a habit therefore cyber security all that comes into the play it's not like a one time exercise a project done tick the box it your kpi done you get your bonus bang so one of the very important approach to clients or even to even uh, media industries listen we got to run our business but we need to think about continuous improvement transformation because of data and cyber security now i like to talk a bit philosophy eh? you talk about data where's the original the data came for me data is like energy you cannot destroy it you cannot lose it it changes form so you can manipulate it yeah that's why it changes form you can fake it fake it so how data cannot get lost it cannot it doesn't disappear it's like energy energy changes form so how the data is mixed with different types of data creates another type of data so data doesn't get lost and you cannot let me be honest you cannot find the source because it's so mixed up it just changes form and then it creates a new form and then become then the information so organizations need to remember that how you keep your data how you mix your data you store some people love to store data just to say this uh, 
you know, some uh, uh, leaders or supervisors, I want to be copied in all emails. I don't care. They get tons of email and they think they're being, doing the job. Actually, you're creating more. I'm going into carbon footprint and more data is created for the sake of satisfying yourself, greed, thinking you're in control, and therefore becomes an opening door for cyber attack. Right? So you need to remember that. You don't simply say, send me for, put me in everything. Put me in everything. Even social media, I always tell guys, you know, you need to pick one or two. You start putting your information across all touch points, you are opening up to more attacks. It's the same like a country, you know, the country that it's on its own, the borders, you got more borders, you more attacks, it's similar principle. Absolutely. But I think before we take this um, conversation a bit more, maybe if there are questions from the floor to any of the speakers. No? Okay. Hold on. <laughs> I, think we can, I think we can stop using the word digital transformation and use mindset transformation from now on. It's mindset transformation. And also, I think it's, it's a bit overused. You know? I agree. Uh, most, I, I, you know, I absolutely it's agree. It's mindset transformation. My son asked me the day, why digital? What's digital? I mean, it's, it's, so they've never seen a cassette before. So you talk about analog digital, they said, you're all digital now. It's, it's a, like a standard. But old folks like us running companies, we talk digital, they understand. Young CEOs like human intellect. You know, we've always been very you know, uh, excited with things that we can measure. So you measure intellect by IQ, right? IQ has a measurement. Then some intelligent person thought that we should also measure emotions. Yeah? So emotional quotient came in. And I was telling Vix in the morning, the word cyber actually comes from a fictional novel. The name of the novel was Necromancer. But there is no measurement for your cyber security capability. Forget about certification. How aware are you? So in fact, one of the things that I've been propagating in a lot of conferences is we should start measuring your cyber capability, cyber quotient. How are, are you well equipped to handle a cyberspace? Cyber uh, world? Brother, brother, no selling of product here. No, no, no product. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, no product. Uh, okay. But I'm saying your okay. measurement, uh, measurement uh, is very uh, critical because what we normally don't measure, we never are able to actually implement it effectively. And that's the reason I'm, I'm stating again and again to the next steps is measurement of uh, what is the awareness level of the organization? How educated my people are? It is very imperative. And I think uh, what Dato was pointing out, if you don't measure, okay, last year I overall scored, like we used to have compliance-based training and measurement. Uh, I still remember when UK Bribery Act came in, uh, I, I used to have a training every quarter, two times, just to ensure that I was you know, going through all the questionnaire. And that rigorousness I don't see in the cybersecurity space still. I'm sure it will come in. I think people like Kavita, Vix, a lot of people in the industry are pushing for it. We need to ensure people are educated, not trained, educated. Speaking of um, you know, getting awareness out there and getting people more educated, I'm thinking, you know, obviously the media is a, a place to go to, but um, what do you think could be that role of, you know, I think we, we will try and figure out some solutions to some, a lot of these problems that we've highlighted today. Um, what, what, it, what would be the role of media associations, for example, in you know, even addressing ethical and unethical yeah. issues? Yeah, one of, the, one of the things, the first things when I, when I was listening to, to the panelists just now is the, the, the expertise that we have in this industry, in this, in this area, you know. The first thing that the media, I think, should do is to tap, you know, should learn. You know, we we are, we can't we can't be teaching, we can't be leading a campaign without really knowing what uh, what there is out there, what the threats, how to defend ourselves, and all that. So I think, I think if I were if I had the opportunity to to take this to the next level, is to to advocate for uh, for the media themselves to to to. Yeah, arm themselves, weaponize themselves 
with knowledge, number one. And number two, recognizing, you know, that we are generally, uh, generally uh, low tech, lah. you know, we're not, we, we're not high tech. We know, we are, we are wordsmith, you know, we keyboard, tap, 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 send, you know, we don't, basically between that and what, when information, things, the, the, the content became data, monetization, blah, 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 is beyond us, you know. But we need, after learning, after knowing all this, you know, but then knowing about the cyber threats, uh, recognizing the cyber threats that are out there, yes, we need to do something about uh, safeguarding ourselves because we are the media. The media, uh, we are the medium, we are the media that are being used to manipulate or to, to, to disseminate information and all that. You know? We need to, I believe that, about that uh, because the media themselves, some are, Okay, not all of us are angels, you know, because like I said just now in the in the in the in, in my five minute talk, some of us are also, you know, I can't prove it. I don't want to prove it, but we are also, we have also jumped into the bandwagon, and there's money to make. We make we have, we try that sometimes, at the at the, at the point of uh, uh, sacrificing our own integrity. So we need the media needs to. Be watchdog to the, this kind of media as well. So that's that's the other thing I would do, you know, because we had, like I said, we had this proposed national media council in the making. We have been proposing it for forty years. We came very close two years ago to getting something going, but it's it's it has again slipped away. But with this kind of threads, perhaps hopefully we can convince the authorities that hey, we want to do something not for ourselves. But for the industry and for the country, and the media council can play a role. Not just the media council cannot play everything. We have to work with guys like you, uh, with the cyber experts, with the other industries, and together formulate something that nobody can make our cyberspace or our world safer. Dato, can I just add something from that point? Also, a proposal must be. <laughs> um, I, 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 like I said, I work with a lot of media partners, and uh, commonly, what I found that um, when they are talking about cybersecurity, um, that topic, they can only focus at one. What happens today? What PDRM is reporting? They will just pick on that. Oh, I'm talking about scam. Oh, I cannot con harini scam. Uh, then I lost my data, and. Um, social media, uh, Facebook, somebody got cheated. Uh, today, someone died because they were trolled in a negative way, uh, commit suicide. So whatever the sensation news is happening related back to the cyber incident due to the cyber action, cyber activities, mm -hmm. and that's what they actually report. So I go back to all my journalist friends and my media friends say, look, cyber safety is more than that. Let me help you all to educate that it is about what you communicate, your email communication, your mobile security, your social media etiquettes, what you write. In fact, everyone, all of, all of us agree today that all of us are also journalists. Every day we've got something to say in our social media that is also to get attention and also to be more attractive in, so, in that platform. So let us get ourselves educated and also to my dear friends of uh, media partners, journalists, you need to know email communication, your mobile security, how do you install a simple antivirus in your mobile? And you know, you need to understand the kind of threat like spyware. You don't even know how people beside like uh, Amita passed his phone to me just now. In that few seconds, I could have just installed something on his mobile. He wanted my number and he passed his handphone to me. <laughs> Exactly, in front of everybody, <coughs> uh, right? And I did a simple demo last time with one of the political leaders, and he just jumped out of his chair. Bring that woman at the back. What I did, I took a selfie, and I said, come, I want to send you my picture. He was very happy and shared me his number instantly. So I sent something else with the picture. <laughs> so you got track. I mean, these are all those technical tricks. That can happen. It's a threat. This threat is also... 
for the journalists, you know, you don't know where you are browsing. Sometimes you're very happy to go and get yourself connected in the public Wi-Fi, start doing transaction and sending information and the sources that you're getting, how do you protect it? You know, these are kind of uh, um, the, the, the cyber safety awareness that you must embed into yourself and then the cyber awareness that need to come in topic of cyber security because it is more than scam alone. Now, the other part is what Anwar mentioned, I think, uh, every one of it, cyber hygiene. Mm -hmm. So that's the topic for people, for users like us, for media people like every one of you here. I, I think, um, you know, um, just, just well, you know, bridging that gap between these two, you know, the media and cyber security, cyber safety, Safe. cyber hygiene, what needs to take place in between? Policies, maybe frameworks, Maybe yeah. you, you can. Um, uh, taking on from what Dato you said, I think we need a collaboration of individuals or groups from different industries. The National Press Council will not be active. Let me be. I'm just being very uh, truthful. If you don't create a collaboration with other industry sectors, like with the information technology sector, like the telecommunication, uh, with the the guys in the IT, with data management, like the AWS and Microsoft, the local guys. So you, my 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 thought is, you need to create a collaboration, all right, where all of us coming together in relation for cyber security for the nation. That's one agenda, and another part is about managing data and media, social media. When you come together, we then create a guideline. It's a guideline, uh, and that guideline can be used by individuals, SMEs, companies. And it was created by experts across industries, which will be used as a guideline. And then from there, they can then start to measure themselves and you know work through the. Because a lot of people went, what's the cybersecurity guideline? We'll go to cybersecurity Malaysia. Yeah, uh, I know I'll tell you, but they want that information so that they can track and manage. And I think it starts with the social media, with the media press coming together, driving this. Uh, don't wait for MCMC. Yeah. Uh, nothing's going to happen. Uh, eh? Okay. I, sorry, bro. I, I don't agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let, let's keep it, in, bro, let's keep it interesting. Um, <laughs> I, I think uh, this talk of uh, actually the media people are not bad. This is good. This is that. I mean, it, let, let's not pacify one another. Lah, okay. There are bad guys out there. There are crooks out there. There are liars out there. And they want to cheat us. They want to steal our money. And they want to cause disharmony. There is a lot of fake news. Uh, one example is uh, Mr. Donald Trump, what he's been doing on, on Capitol Hill. We all know six people died, so on and so forth. I think we need to, sorry my language, we need to kick ass. Okay, We don't have enough laws and regulation. Maybe if it's in place, it is not being enforced enough. Uh, there is under Communication and Multimedia Act, if I'm not wrong, uh, Section 233, that you are not supposed to forward offensive materials. And offensive materials could be, you know, pornographic, so on and so forth, which every morning I send some to Amitabh and all of that, you know. So, but I know to him, he doesn't find it offensive, so I think it's okay. But of course, if I send it to Kavita, it might be a different story. So, I think this is what we need to do. Uh, but how do you regulate? Mm. Who is supposed to know what I am sending to Amitabh unless he complains to MCMC? I am very disappointed with this officer under your ministry. He's always sending me all this stuff. Uh, you know, so this is where I think we are missing out. There are specific laws in few other countries. For example, in Turkey, you go to jail. In Poland, there is certain fines. In China, they maybe kill you. Okay. In Malaysia, you know, they just, you know, Bagila, I want to share also as well. I want to know what you are giving. So I think the the regulation, the enforcement needs to be looked into as well. Okay. Uh, we are so busy arguing about 5G that sometimes we lose the context. What is 5G all about? Okay. What is it all about? It's you know, you have a bigger pipe, you have to need. And, and for what you are saying, Wix, uh, we can collaborate, we can work together. But if I have a 4G highway, 5G highway, and my traffic is going back and forth, hey, bro, you need to slow down so I can go first. No, 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 cannot. I cannot do that. 
I also have my data that I want to send across. So there needs to be specific laws. And, and we've been fighting for cybersecurity Cyber. law since 2010. Okay. And, and until today, uh, we don't see the light of the day. Hopefully, one day it will come about. But it should not be draconian like what has been happening in Thailand or in mainland China. It should be risk assessment. It should be cyber hygiene. It should be constructive to the industry. But laws, we definitely need. But again, the problem will be, yes, we have so many laws. How are we going to regulate? How are we going to enforce it? Yeah, I, um, I, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but um, you know, now we are on the topic of policy and regulatory environment. From an industry perspective, um, you know, what does Malaysia need to do to you know evolve this policy and regulatory environment in order to ensure that business the business ecosystem is you know safe, secure for investors, especially or even local businesses, SMEs, because I think SMEs have I been think we facing need to have a separate session for this. <laughs> it's long. This is a long discussion. Is, okay. there, there is no silver <laughs> bullet. Okay. Um, of course, I think we, we have gone through that, you know. We need to do the awareness part. We need to look into now. I mean, what, what I, we have brought in policies, guidelines, regulations, so on and so forth. But I think an easy answer would be this. This is your business. Isn't it? I think Vicks have already said that. This is your business. You should know what to do. Okay. Sorry, actually, okay. just that because we got an, a question online um, uh, from the our viewers online. Uh, what speaking of you know this is our business. Uh, what should CEOs know about cyber threats or cybersecurity threats um, that their companies are facing? I mean, what because I know I mean I know this is going back to um, you know what everyone's presented okay, uh, really, but really maybe. Let, let, let me say this like, I mean, information is available online. If the CEO comes and tells me, tell me what, I will say you're not fit to be a CEO because yeah. the information is available. Yeah. I don't need to come and spoon feed you. If I spoon feed you, that's a, how you run an organization. All right? It's, it's like someone asking you, hey, you know, um, what do I need to eat to, to stay healthy? Yeah. What? So, okay, actually, like something like that. To, like, to be yeah, honest, yeah. From, from, a, from a CEO perspective, I'm a CEO, I, I want to know about cybersecurity. First thing, I, I, we already have a cybersecurity in Malaysia. All right? Touch base with them. Listen, I have my organization. I got 200 employees. This is what I do. Do you have any guidelines? All right? Or they pass you to the right person kind of thing. Taking action, not saying, tell me what to do. If I tell you what to do, nothing's going to move. Okay, to be fair, to be fair, let's, let's be polite, okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, too late now, like that, okay? Let's be polite. Uh, I think the first thing that any CEO should do is to understand what are his company's crown jewels. What are the most important data that he must protect? Example, last week uh, I gave a talk to the Malay Chamber of Commerce and uh, there was this lady after that, Tapi kan Januar, saya uh, doktor untuk wellness, spa lah kan? Of course, I layan her lah because she's good looking kan? Okay lah, I pun, ah, tapi doctor, uh, it is not about it's about your customer data. How many clients do you have? Uh, about 1,000 plus. What data do you have about them? Ada credit card number? Ada? Ada alamat? Ada? Ada phone number? Ada? Ah, itulah. That's what I want to steal. So with this data, I can sell this on the dark web. Maybe, you know, 10 US dollar, 50 US dollar per record. Eh, mahal macam tu ke? Ah, itulah cerita dia. Of course, then I got her handphone number. Lah, kan? ah, that's another story. So, yes, I think that the first thing that needs to be done is any CEO should be aware of what critical data they are holding. Like in this case, this poor doctor, she does not even know that she is actually holding clients' data that is so valuable. So, my next question was, what are you doing to protect this? Ah, so, well done. So, that's, that, and I hope, answers that. Lah. Okay, I mean, you want to add? I'll just add to it and I, I will try and clean it up slightly. <laughs> um, so there are steps which are defined in terms of looking at how do you consolidate an organization. And the first step is called as asset identification. So you basically look at what he was articulating, crown jewels, which is the most important asset in your organization. So you take that organization, ask that CEO to look at their core business. 
what is the most critical aspect of that core business that you need to protect? Like, for example, if it's a bank, uh, if it's a bank, uh, you need to look at if uh, you know the customer database is very critical, then that customer database needs to be protected. Every organization on the world, in the world, has a budgetary constraint. Now, it's a given. You don't have umpteen amount of money at all times. Then you need to do the next step, which is prioritization. What I need to protect today, which is critical, and what I can actually protect later. Then comes the next uh, step is to choice. Is to actually have choices out there that these are the set of uh, security controls that I will put in to protect my asset. Last but not the least is then setting up people and process together, where process comes in and then people orientation comes in. So this is a step-by-step -step flow. Uh, and the reason it is done in this process is you never choose technology first. You choose a technology absolutely in the end. You first put the processes in place, put what are you protecting in place, and then see what the technology will be. And just to finish that so that he gets a better answer is, doesn't matter which technology you bring. Doesn't matter. If you have the right team, good processes in place, they will protect you. You get best technology in the world. Don't train your manpower. Don't put the processes in place. You will have a problem. Okay. Well, yeah. Rosanna, thank you for um, to Amit actually to be more polite. <laughs> more patient yes. to educate again it's going back to the point of education right but he's just putting the processes by number one number two number three number four but they jump into the they say no you resign <laughs> you don't know. you're not fit to be a ceo now actually right just to add on the process now this is about having a planning this is a strategy that you need to have as a ceo in the company during, before, um, before, during, and after. So during, when you're planning how you want to protect your data, what are the data need to be protected in terms of securing it, backup, what kind of data you want to backup, what are the recovery time objective you have, how fast I want to back backup, and how fast I want to recover if there's an incident. And even though there's an incident happen, how do we manage the crisis? And after that, how we bring the business back as usual. So this yeah, is, is back to what yeah. you were saying before, yes. like, you know, anticipation, yeah. anticipating yeah. the threats, crisis. Yeah. Yeah. I think just to marry that question uh, with... Guys, uh, guys, we are not talking about cybersecurity. <laughs> wrong forum. We are talking about weaponized information. Yeah, correct, correct, correct. Yeah. Wrong, I wrong. I think we'll yeah. have correct, to get correct. Dr. Rocky to comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wrong yeah. platform. Facilitator. Okay. No, just to marry that question with uh, what Dato was pointing out and what your earlier question was, what should we do to bridge the requirement of the journalistic world to uh, what is required in the, um, you know, what is out there in the cybersecurity training world. See, again, Dato, here we need to take a step-by-step -step approach. The reason I'm pointing it out is it's very, you know, nice to say we should train everyone. May or may not be a viable option to do it. What should you train them on? What are is in amongst the journalists? Is there different categorization of journalists? Are there some very sensitive frontline journalists who needs to have you know a very secured out system? Is there certain journalists who is only rec uh, reporting on economies? Do does he require different kind of security infrastructure and uh, security? All that needs to be studied, and based on that, then you need to dovetail, curate, and make trainings which are specific that to that audience. Because it's very nice to say we should have cybersecurity awareness across the board. In practicality, uh, you know, being very um, broad in terms of delivering something actually doesn't have any um, <laughs> benefit to the end consumer. Okay, well, I do have two other questions, and this is more on um, mainstream media dissemination of fake news. What are the causes and consequences of mainstream media dissemination of fake news? And what are the ways to avoid the spread of, you know, false info on social media? So maybe Dr. Rocky, you can. That was my and Dr. Dr. Kavita, do we marry these two expertise on, on, on to answer these questions? And I think also the the mainstream media um, dissemination of fake news. Um, you know, what 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 would your thoughts be on? Yeah, um, more and more, the mainstream media, maybe under pressure from 
from from the the very quick and very brutal way uh, social media report news in 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 responding to in responding to news breaks sometimes mainstream media just capture news and publish knowing very well that if there's a mistake there we can always take pull it back you know unlike unlike dulu kan dulu publish and be damned okay you publish you answer for it now you think you can get away so that is that is the approach that is basically causing a lot of uh, not just fake news sometimes um yeah misinformation you know to go out you know you you have you you have got let's say you got you you have 100000 readers but 1000 readers caught it okay it's already out there and this thousand will spread the media and the viral and it happens you know so that publish and be damn should be brought back to you know when i talk about uh, education educating reeducating the media and all that this this what is my new my new my younger journalists they very tech, more tech savvy than us you know so very little because they, they didn't come from the old school of uh, journalism so they're quicker but they're also less concerned about about your know, fake news or about misinformation and all that so we have to also strike a balance in the newsroom to get to make sure that our professionalism is intact you know we want to bring we want to break news and all that but sometimes we just have to wait and hold hold back and say that okay then suddenly you suddenly it pays off oh you to orang belum mati lah you know can you imagine you publish something that the for the bugger has died you know but he's still alive so that's sometimes very basic things but it happens yeah the second one i'll pass to you <laughs> But I think that sometimes it is about what the audience are expecting. It's actually putting a pressure on the journalists. It's a sensational news, yeah. right? I'm expecting yeah. sensational, and then that's a pressure for me because before I even write, see, pen is actually the weapon of uh, journalists those days, lah. But sekarang is the internet, you know. As soon as I get the information, I'll be the first person to disseminate and share it. You know, I don't validate. I don't verify the information. I don't care whether it's legitimate or not. But I have a group of audience that love my writings, so I write it first. So that kind of pressure is happening on the journalists. Sekarang aku bukan cakap macam journalists kan sebab lah, you punya team kan. So okay, so that one part of it. What was the second question that I was supposed to answer? Okay, I think from a journalist point of view, like what Dato have actually said, you do not want to do that, and it will definitely tarnish your career. Right. If you want to become better of the, or rather, where Datu is sitting now to who he is today, is the integrity and the ethical way of writing and putting up news, has made him come this far. So I think he should be an example of those who wants to be at where they wanted to be in the career as a journalist, as a media practitioner, right? Um, so that that talk about the integrity and also the ethical way of writing, that's number one. But again, I also would like to emphasize for the audience, or uh, rather the people, the listeners here, who wants to become a journalist by themselves. I have a platform, I have a Twitter account, I have a TikTok, I have Instagram, I have Facebook, I have LinkedIn, damn, I will write whatever I want. We, that yeah, is unethical. Citizen journalism exactly. And people yeah. think there is no way of taking legal action. As long there is no one is actually reporting it, I will just use it as a weapon to hunt them anybody that I like. So that is very unethical. And um, please remember, whatever that you write, if I'm offended, if I go and make a police report, there's still way for us to take legal action on you. Yeah, that, that actually mm. answers it. Can, One of the other questions, what do you think is the impact of unconfirmed so, stories spread online? So I think that, uh, that question has been answered. Yeah, now. let me add on. So uh, I'm talking from an artificial intelligence point of view. All right, uh, There are a lot of uh, guys working on AI so that you have an uh, application on your desktop, your app, or your phone. When you're reading that message, let's say someone puts a Twitter, the AI will check and give a rating whether it's level of fakeness or truth, all right? So that is one of the things people will need to think before you put your content out because this is coming because we use technology to to eradicate fake news. So it, I, it's not far away. I've seen some, we're working with some guys. It could be very, very powerful. 
I think it's not eradicate. I think it's more of mitigate. Nah. Yeah, eradicate means it, when I say to people validate, people validate stop validate. putting messages validate. because they'll know hey, all messages for Anwar is all fake yeah. because it's rating very low. No, there, there are a lot of fact check uh, sites <laughs> now. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of fact check sites and uh, they are primarily being built on the AI engine. The reason they are existing now is the this fake news is a problem which is now becoming aggravated because it's just not you know sticking to elections. It is just going beyond now. And I, I think yesterday in the meeting with, uh, the, with Dr. Kavita was having with Nurdin, we I think you touched upon uh, this aspect also how the spread happens. And one of the aspects of fake news is that it starts influencing different people in a different way. And especially if you look at the younger generation, which are mostly Twitter users and many of them Facebook users, the impact that it leaves has a lot of social, you know, social implications. And that's the reason a lot of these fact check sites are coming up, and uh, they are they are doing a lot of experimentation yeah. with the AI engine. I, I think if yeah. if there is one example that people need to know was the incident that happened in India a couple of years back. Remember before yeah. Facebook, you could forward to as many people as possible, and then uh, the incident was where two guys were beaten up. And then uh, it got manipulated that, you know, the Muslims and the Hindus oh, yeah, are yeah, fighting. Yeah. So, yeah. so in many geographies, I think India is just a, a classic example where uh, you have multiple ethnicity and multiple religions. This, this has been used very effectively by people who want to hurt. And the word hacktiv hacktivism is actually um, overspelt and under understood. The reason I have say, uh, stating that is, and hacktivist is also motivated with money. The biggest motivator in the world of uh, hacking is money. And a lot of these hacktivists are actually paid. And they, they actually have big, big, uh, you know, account setups to do it. But yes, uh, there is a lot of, uh, um, I think the protectors of the world are trying a lot of experimentation around AI engines. AI engines. And one of the things is keyword search, that though. So if these kind of words exist, there is a fair, you know um, option of not letting the Twitter go forward yeah. with forwarding it or WhatsApp. Oh, or you totally them. Yeah, and then yeah. there's also no okay. search engine they optimization with keywords, and I think even the journalists these days have been writing with you know, you know, pumping in keywords to just get you know the media coverage. But um, we we do have. I think that we will keep this as the last two questions, probably. Um, what can CEOs do to mitigate cybersecurity threats? Again, it's a cybersecurity question, but I think um, uh, maybe this time, uh, you know, Rocky, you, you can comment on how CEOs can mitigate maybe a, meet, a weaponized information attack on the company. I can only comment on if the CEO is facing, the company is facing a, um, attack. You know, uh, uh, mal information or uh, uh, somebody, katalah, let's see, a uh, 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 competitors. You know, company A has 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 uh, employed some writers to attack the competitors. You know, in many ways. You know, maybe maybe talk about an inferior or seemingly inferior product uh, policy on 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 traders, online traders or something like that, you know, and find a way to bring this news to the newspaper, mainstream media. This is how, this is how things work now. You start on a, on a social media, you try and push it to the media. So bigger, like you said, bigger, bigger, bigger platform, you get spiral. And in terms of credibility, orang tengok pun the public says, hey, it's in, it's in the star. You know, it's not just in the vibes or in some Facebook, you know. So it becomes more. So the CEO facing this will have to employ you know, the, the, the normal, the usual uh, uh, corporate com or strategic com exercise. But they will need to, they will, every company now will need to know someone who knows the network out there. You know, because it's not talk, it's, you're not dealing with news editors anymore. Correct. You're dealing with Eddie C this, Eddie C that, you know, um, little tweeters here and there who are very powerful and um, ni macam, macam influencers, lah. Lah. influencers, yeah, influencers and all that. And to, to, to the CEOs need to have a team already 
okay? especially we have, we have big organization ceo means even the head of political party you know or, or a think tank you need to have already this about these experts or or people in your outfit to be able to deal with this you know not not uh, not on a on a consistent basis not just when the attacks happen yeah i think when it comes to the media it, it, maybe we can also um, say you know the ceos now have to be wary of what's out there because this can affect their reputation which will eventually possibly affect share prices and even the value of you know the business um, i think with that maybe we can end and continue this discussion closed door um, so <laughs> thank you very much panelists and i think we will get um muru to have the closing remark shortly thank, thank you so thanks. much thank you, Okay, uh, thank you. So we will have to end this um, session. Before that, we I would like to call upon Mr. Murugesen R. Thangaratnam, a, a leading proponent of cyber resilience and sustainable digital change. And I think all of us know that. Um, Mr. Murugesen, Executive Chairman of Advanced Security Network for your closing remarks, please. Hi. Um, I prepared eight pages, uh, eight pages of uh, you know on my speech. I'm, I'm normally I'm normally not good at uh, preparing speeches. I speak off the cuff, so I prepared, and then after listening to all the speakers, I've decided to just keep it one side and just to help with the <laughs> with my prepared speech. Uh, first of all, let me thank all the speakers personally. Uh, thank you so much for. I know each of you, uh, you know, you've got your very busy schedules, uh, and all of you all are you know basically subject meta experts in your own areas. You know, so let me thank the speakers first. Uh, let me thank Nordin and his beautiful team for organizing this event and uh, coordinating. Their, their coordination was fantastic. They were always on the ball and you know getting things done very quickly. Uh, even if when, when Dr. Amir couldn't make it uh, last minute yesterday, uh, you know very quickly they they managed to get things done for each Anwar, you know, and 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 get him on board. So I would like to thank them. Uh, a special thanks to Rear Admiral Dato. Uh, for gracing us with his presence because his presence here uh, also gives us 
some sort of validity or you know uh, that you know that we, we are doing something worth worth everyone's time so uh, thank you very much uh, dato for for coming here now uh, I, as i said i prepared a lot of stuff but i think um, all of you have touched on whatever that i wanted to say uh, norudin picked up a topic and gave it to me without asking my permission he published it and then only i, I read my topic online so you know uh, you know <laughs> resource allocation for effective cybersecurity you know so basically he thought this guy is the money man you know might as well get him to talk about money you know at the end of the day whatever plans we have you know we can uh, uh, speak till the cows come home but we hit a roadblock when you need to get the funds to actually uh, what do you call get your dreams or your aspirations uh, reality so that's that's always been an issue but i we well, are talking about funds uh, before i go into that we are talking about fake news because i noticed you know we are talking about weaponized information we are talking about fake news let me tell you something about fake news uh, imagine a village about 50 60 years ago in a village uh, there's this girl she's about to get married okay their plans to get her married uh, unfortunately you know, just two or three days before you know the 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 uh, you know in india and all that they used to always bring the groom to come and see the prospective bride Uh, she's got a friend in school and uh, he's a guy and she just popped by at his place and they decided to just have a chat and uh, later two people saw this and spread a rumor that she spent a couple of hours with this guy just two days before this guy has come to see her you know this this prospective groom comes to see her so that's fake news fake news has been there for ages is just that digitalization has accelerated the reach of fake news so i think if you are talking about fake news and how to stop fake news and all that stuff i think every one of us as a citizen has to play our part uh, i remember uh, i think uh, uh, dr rocky mentioned that you know the, the the reason they want to set up the the council is to actually self regulate which i think is amazing you know the initiative that they're taking itself the planning itself is amazing because i always used to tell people that humans cannot self regulate if there's no bar council every lawyer will be standing on the streets and selling his uh, an smp for 50% discount if there's no medical association doctors will be uh, probably selling their services you know on a discounted rate so the fact that we have actually have a regulatory body or a, a, a higher authority looking at these practices is because generally human beings our nature is we are not able to self regulate so the fact that the initiative is being taken itself is fantastic because i think self censorship is the only thing that can stop fake news nothing else nothing else okay if you really want to go down hard on fake news then you got to go down the road of actually coming up with stricter laws you know why are there penif- why are there punishments why are there capital punishments why are there heavy fines because they are deterrents so if you want to stop fake news you either have to go that way as in you come down really hard just pick 10 people at random who spread fake news and go down really hard on them and frighten the living daylights of everyone else who thinks they can get away with it my late dad used to have used to always say this he had a lot of nuggets but there's one thing they used to always tell me he said morals are high when opportunities are low so everybody's got high morals when opportunities are low So when you know there's an opportunity for you to to forward a message and get away with it you'll do it. But if you know that forwarding the message could result in probably someone standing outside your door and saying excuse me we know you forwarded that message. Can you follow us please? So you have two ways of going. Either do that or practice self censorship. Because if you're going to accuse the media of weaponizing information or you going to talk about weaponized information or if you going to blame the media if i receive a piece of news which i think is not right for me to forward and i forward it i'm no less ethical than the person who sent me the news you know so i think self censorship is key now let me get uh, to the, the the question of how much do you allocate for cyber security well uh I actually wrote down some stuff and all that there are certain formulas you know I've got a couple of friends in the industry who gave me some formulas and all that stuff but I'm going to go to the very basic I remember a conversation I had uh, with a group of people I was uh, part of a, of an of a gathering called the Malaysian uh, Business Breakfast Club it was actually an offshoot of BNI I think you know BNI you know Business Network so these guys you know they and we used to meet at a crazy time 6:00 in the morning 
every Thursdays in Hilton Hotel, PJ Hilton. This is about 20 years ago. Yeah, about 20 years ago. So the idea was just a networking group. Each person represents one industry. We get, out, get together in the morning, we share thoughts, and then we give referrals. Okay? So every week they used to have a, uh, a set where that particular industry player can give a presentation on his business. So that, that happened to be uh, my, my, my session. And uh, I always tell people security is, is in my DNA. It's not my profession. Uh, my dad was a pioneer in the industry, so I grew up in, in security. You know? And why I say the word security is I've never considered cybersecurity as anything to do with IT. Cybersecurity is basically security, plain and simple. It's security. It's just that the platform, the medium has changed, but it's security in principle. So I was pre presenting at that time, of course, the big thing was about CCTVs and security systems at homes and all that stuff. So I was presenting. So there, there was this particular lady, I don't want to mention uh, Datin, and she was, uh, she's always been very, you know, she's the type of person who's always got something very smart to say, you know. So uh, I always tell my, my, my kids, surround yourself with intelligent people. But avoid spending time with two intelligent people. You know, so these are the people who know everything and anything. So she was, she wanted to pick one on me, you know. So she told me, she said, oh, these things are all very expensive, you know. How much, you know, how do you determine how much you spend on, on, on systems and all that stuff? You know, this, all this out there, they are all expensive. They rip off this, that, and all that stuff. So I told her, I said, uh, Datin, I said, very simple. Let me give you a, do a, a simple calculation of the whiteboard. I said, let's value your assets. Okay. So we are talking about your home. Uh, you know, of course, I'm also pretty sarcastic when I need to be. As I said, I'm, I'm sure you're living in a very big bungalow, you know. So let's put a value on that. Can we just put a, roughly a value? So we put up a value. And then I said, let's put a value on the, the your, your, your property, whatever you have. And, you know, if you have money, you have, you know, stuff, let's put a value on that. So we just worked out a certain sum. Then I said, will you be willing to spend 0.1% of this value, on that value, 0.1% on security? Okay, fair. So I said, anyway, I have not completed yet. What's the value? Uh, is, your, is your mother staying with you or any parents? He said, my, both my mother-in-law and my, my father-in-law are staying with me. I said, what's the value on them? Because if somebody breaks into your house, okay, and he's threatened, and he kills one of these people, what value would you put on them? Total silence. So you cannot actually come up with a formula. You as the business owner, you as the head of government, you have to first of all, like what I think um, Mr. Admita mentioned and uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure all the speakers mentioned, determine what your crown jewels are. What are you trying to protect? Not all data is critical. Okay, let me be very clear in that. Don't go and bring a sledgehammer to a thumbtack. It doesn't make sense. You know, no... What is critical? That's very, very important. You know, you need to go through that process. Uh, unfortunately, all of us have been change, uh, chasing technology. Technology has overtaken us and gone way beyond where we are today. So we are all chasing. We've been obsessed with speed. We've been obsessed with getting information. You know, we feel that, hey, I want to be the first person to get the information. As soon as I get the information and I send it and everyone is like shocked that I've got the information, you feel you have a very good, feel good feeling. So we have, we have been all got, got, got into this, this stuff. Somewhere along the line, we have compromised heavily, heavily on security. You know, I think someone brought up, I think Chanwa brought up the fact that, you know, someone said that, hey, the data is, you know, it's just a copy. Do you know how valuable your data is? Let me give you a, a, a real life uh, incident that happened a few days ago. I, had, I was having a, a breakfast with someone at a TPC. It was a meeting with a guy who's, was a fairly uh, big boy in the uh, private sector, okay? A certain app that all of us are using now is now in the planning stages of being commercialized, okay? Now, this app, as we speak, carries data of 50 million people. Then, uh, literally, almost all the uh, Malaysian popula population, plus travelers and all that stuff, okay? I'm sure you, you'll know more or less which app I'm talking about. They're in the process of commercializing it. Because today they are negotiating with the government. For the government, they're giving the uh, government an option to buy the app and all the data that comes along with it for a price of one billion. And all of us sitting here, we are all part of that one billion. 
Okay, so data today is money. Data is oil. You know, data is power. So there's no such thing as I've got a copy. If you go, if I tell an auditor today, if someone gets a copy of every single uh, client's details, how can that not be dangerous? Our auditors, after our, our, our spouses, the other person who knows everything about us is our auditor. All the creative accounting, you know. So would you like to, uh, you know, as someone to have access to all your creative accounting, all your discussions with the auditor? I'm sure not. Yeah, you still have the original copy, but someone else has that copy also. So there's no such thing as, you know, uh, copying, you know, there's, a, you know, there's only a copy, the original is there. So I think here, uh, I want to throw this, I've, I've, I've added on one more question, Norin. Uh, I normally, I do that. Five questions to you all. Think about it, you don't need to answer that. You can use it for yourself. This, you, this, you can apply it on yourself. You can, you can go to your office tomorrow and give your staff, you know, maybe give them a quiz and ask them to think about it. Okay? Now, before I ask the question, I will, I know, I just like to ask, if I were to ask any one of you here how much money you have, I'm sure, you know, you would be able to give me to the detail. You, know? you will know, have an idea, you know, how many bank accounts you have, how much you have and all that stuff. How many assets you have, more or less, what's the value of your assets. You know, all that you will be able to answer. Now, i ask you these five questions. As we speak now, do you know where all your data is exactly? Do you know who has access to your data? So that's the second question. Do you know where your data is? Do you know who has access to your data? Do you know what your data is being used for? Do you know the exact value of your data? And do you know what are the estimated losses if your data is compromised or lost? And when I say losses, I'm not talking directly about financial losses. I'm talking about reputational losses, downtime, you know, all this stuff. Uh, I, I, I'm a member of the Malaysian Dutch Business Council. So we had our first uh, uh, business networking session uh, a few weeks ago. And we had some government uh, representatives who, you know, came and spoke about, you know, the, the, the uh, investment landscape in Malaysia and all that stuff. So I was talking to, uh, but the interesting thing, there were five speakers from the government and five from the private sector. Nine of the speakers, despite the fact they were talking about uh, stuff like real estate, and, and, and logistics and all that. Nine of the speakers mentioned the word cybersecurity. So that got me very thrilled, you know. Uh, so I was talking to this guy uh, from InvestKL, and he's heading the team that uh, actually uh, talks to potential investors from Europe. And he was telling me that lately when they talk to investors there, one of the key questions they're asking, how secure is your cybersecurity uh, framework in Malaysia? How mature is your cybersecurity industry? Because you're talking about a digital economy. You're talking about people coming and setting up data centers here. You're talking about people coming and investing here. And when we're talking about, uh, I don't want to say digital transformation. Okay, we'll say digital transformation for the sake of digital transformation. You know? But if you're talking about that, you're basically talking about, you know, I, I have this interesting thing. All of us today here, we don't realize we actually live in two parallel worlds. We used to always say physical world and spiritual world. Well, let me tell you, all of us here today, we live in a physical world and a digital world. And with all the things that they are talking about, which is already there, these discussions are already going there, it's already going to come, I'm sure. And Amitabh was one of the people who enlightened me on this. You're talking about stuff like metaverse and NFTs and all that stuff. Tomorrow, there's going to be two Norins. Norin of the physical world and Norin of the digital world. So we all live in two different worlds. In the physical world, we are pretty clear on what we have and how we secure ourselves. You know, it's, it's security by default. We lock our doors by default. We don't think. At the same time, in our digital world, something comes in, accept, accept. Okay, cookies, accept, accept, accept. Without knowing what we, what we are doing. So in the digital world, I think, I know, sorry for the word, but in the digital world, most of us are totally naked. Totally naked. So I think if you're talking about resource allocation, I know the, the, you know, the sea suits and the, 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 the business owners uh, and even government for the matter, you know, uh, budgeting, uh, prioritizing is very important. Okay. 
So, you know, like what Inchian Wise just spoke about yesterday, he said, you know, if you go and tell them spend on cybersecurity, they will think about it. Because they are more concerned about, hey, Banje, flood. We need to go and give money to the guy immediately. So that's priority spending. This is not. But then you mean you need to know how to talk to your guys. You need to tell them what happens when there's a banje and the entire financial system where you're relying on that money to pay those victims, you cannot access it. Now I ask you all, do you think cyber attacks are going to reduce or increase in the future? There's no way it's going to reduce because it's already extremely high at a time when we are not even fully digital yet. So once 5G comes in, once we fully digitalize, how can it even reduce? I don't see an end to cyber attacks. You can probably see an end to the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, but I don't see an end to cyber attacks. It's only going to increase. So you need to, first of all, identify your digital assets, go through a process, you know, uh, I would advise if you're an organization or a government, you know, if you have not done it already, have a health check done. If you, you know, all of us today, you know, we are fairly confident about our health. You know. If I ask Vix, hey Vix, how, how are you, know, how are healthy? Hey, I'm good, bro, pop, pop, pop. He'll probably tell me that. Tomorrow morning goes for a, for, for a checkup and he finds he's got three blocks and he's a walking time bomb. You know, so we are all fairly confident about ourselves, you know, but confidence alone doesn't sustain you in business. You know, you need to continuously uh, check. So I think uh, as for you know, for as far as cybersecurity is concerned, go and get a health check done. See how secure are you? Are you really secure? You may have already spent a lot of money and a lot of sophisticated equipment, but to me, the people, process, technology, I don't waste my time most of the time when I'm giving talks. I don't talk about technology because technology is just technology. You know, there's a shoe out there which is twenty ringgit. There's also a shoe out there, a Nike for five hundred ringgit. You know, so it all, you know, technology is technology. It is basically, you know, I used to tell people, uh, uh, what is that? Uh, I'm a footballer. So, you know, I, 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 I've, I've got a veterans team. I used to play for the state. So I went out to Al Iksan Sports Shop uh, uh, a couple of years ago, just because you know, due to COVID, I didn't play for two years. But, and this is young boy salesman. And he came up and, you know, trying to sell me these Adidas boots. I mean, the, the price of boots have just gone crazy. Like, you know, 600, 700 ringgit, you know, all kind of stuff. He was telling me. And he was, no, the, the, the boots had some curves in front. So he said, Bang, you pack any, uh, if you use this, uh, you, bullet, you can curl, curve the ball. So I told him, if you give this book to a guy who's Kaki Banku, he can never curve the ball till, till the end of eternity. You need to know how to play football. Curving a ball has nothing to do with the boots. So the technology part, I think, is there, it's available. It's the tough part, is the people, the process. Changing people's mindset, that's why I call it mindset transformation, is the biggest battle and it's long haul. You know? So I think, you know, we keep talking about upskilling and reskilling and all that. I, I, my favorite word is unlearning. You know, just dumping what we already know. It's not easy. You know, it's like suddenly, you know, you love lamb steaks and going on a vegetarian diet. It's not easy. But if you need to do it, then it's a process that you have to go through. So I think that's that's what I wanted to you know just highlight. So as far as resource allocation is concerned, you know your value, you know your company's value. You should know if you are compromised, whether you can survive, or how long it'll take for you to bounce back. You determine. Okay, if you need expert help, you probably can get a consultant or get someone out there to come and, and assist you. You know, but you need to first of all know whether it's. You know, it's worth taking the supplements, you know, whether it's worth going for a, a medical checkup, whether it's worth, you know, and, 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 yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, and like what Wix said, you know, selling insurance, yes, insur uh, insurance, uh, I will agree and disagree with you, Wix. Cybersecurity is like selling insurance, but today, insurance is by default. If you walk into a hospital today, before they even ask you what's wrong with you, they'll ask you whether you have insurance first. Then they'll determine what's wrong with you. You know, so insurance is by default. So cyber security will eventually, I am very confident, become an audit requirement. So it is no more an option for you. It will eventually become an audit requirement. If you want to deal with a company, B2B, the company will actually require you to have minimum uh, cyber security 
uh, frameworks and policies in place. If it's, yeah, if it's a government and a government, same thing. It's already happening now. The European investors are asking, how secure are you? They want to know whether there are regulations in place. You know, so the ACTA cybersecurity is crucial. Okay, so it's not a matter of if or how, it's when. So it will eventually become, so of course when that happens, people like me, our business becomes easier. Lah. So I don't have to go out and market anymore. You know, they'll just look me up in the directory and see, you know. So and my company's name starts A, so you'll probably come up first, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, so you have RMIT in, 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 so but if you're talking about cybersecurity posture and cybersecurity uh, readiness, you're talking about the top, ten, leave the ten, top 10% out. The financial institutions and all that is, you know, MINDEF and all that. This, this, these are the top 10%. I'm talking about the balance. 97% of businesses are SMEs. How secure are SMEs? If tomorrow a guy was making a component, just a small tiny component for a BMW, if he is compromised, that component completes the car. So I don't have to go to Auto Bavaria and, and, and hack them. I just hack the guy who's just making that one small component. You can't buy a, a $500,000 BMW without an ashtray there, you know, or whatever, you know. So, so this is very important. So I think that's where, you know, you have to you know, decide. And uh, once again, uh, let me thank everyone. But before I thank uh, everyone, I just want to also say that, you know, for those who don't know, on the 28th, 29th and 30th, uh, they're having the uh, DSA conference, Defense Services Asia conference. And I think it's for the first time they're having a cybersecurity pavilion, if I'm not mistaken. First time they have a cybersecurity pavilion. Uh, and... Dato Ray Admiral is the, actually the uh, co-head of the cybersecurity, uh, you know, uh, conference. And uh, uh, go online. Uh, I'm sure you can also ask from Dato or Inchianwa knows uh, knows the details. Uh, this is uh, a Malaysian uh, initiative, so I hope we, you know all of us can support that. Uh, so that's all I have to say for now. Thank you very much. God bless us all. God bless Malaysia and stay cyber secure. Thank you. Thank you, Muru, for the closing remarks. So I think with that, we will end um, the session today and we will adjourn for a press conference as well as uh, closed-door discussion over lunch. Thank you.